My name is Sam Dachlin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. These are excerpts from an interview I've given. Question. In July 2014, the Department of Homeland Security in the United States and the FBI warned the various branches of the U.S. government, police, and public safety and security organization of a malicious online activity called Google Dorking. What is it? Google Dorking, or Google Hacking, is the use of advanced search queries in Google, Bing, or Yahoo to locate sensitive information, such as usernames and passwords, account numbers, social security numbers, etc. The FBI explains it well in its confidential circular, which ironically was leaked to the press. It says, malicious cyber actors are using advanced search techniques referred to as Google Dorking, to locate information that organizations may not have intended to be discoverable by the public, or to find website vulnerabilities for use in subsequent cyber attacks. By searching for specific file types and keywords, malicious cyber actors can locate information such as usernames and passwords, email lists, sensitive documents, bank account details, and website vulnerabilities. Oddly and disconcertingly, these data are often available publicly. High schools put mostly valid passwords and usernames to expensive subscription databases and for pay media on their internet-facing library portals. Public libraries publish the first eight or nine digits of their library card numbers or barcodes, making it relatively easy to guess the rest. A variety of, uh, of service providers neglect to deny to search engines access to client lists, social security numbers, confidential and sensitive commercial information, and even state secrets. All it takes to exclude Google, Bing, and Yahoo, and to deny their spiders access, is a robot text file on the server. Yet it is missing. Sites like Bug Me Not encourage users to create fake email accounts and to submit thousands of usernames and passwords to numerous restricted online services and products. And government agencies and other national bodies are as leaky as sieves. The syntax of the search strings needed to elicit these bits of sometimes crucial data is laughably simple. Both malicious actors and more benign types avail themselves of this cornucopia. The less savory operators hide behind proxy servers and applications, or online anonymizers, and they harvest, dump, prodigious amounts of data from databases, sometimes using automated tools and scripts. White hackers, gray hackers, and intrepid reporters openly conduct penetration testing or simply verify the validity of publicly posted access credentials. These types of actors end up sharing their findings in order to improve the overall safety of the Internet, and they never disguise their identity. Then there are collectors, those who amass huge piles of information but never make use of it, and students, and more rarely faculty, who illegally access specific databases for limited periods of time in order to conduct targeted studies. But is Google Dorking legal? The situation is not helped by the fact that laws in the United States and in the European Union are outdated or exceedingly vague, allowing criminals to go unpunished or overzealous prosecutors to terrorize minor infringers for mere contractual violations of terms of service. In 2013, a prominent net activist and the inventor of the web feed format RSS, Aaron Swartz, committed suicide in the wake of such a ruthless investigation of what many, including the victim itself, the online database, database JSTOR, well, many perceived to have been a misdemeanor. Where do most of these hackers come from? During a two-month period, I came across dozens of forums in Iran and other developing countries, where students and faculty posted usernames and passwords for online academic and, search data and research databases. Via YouTube, I found websites which provide simultaneous access to the easy proxies, access points, of several universities, 
or force download full text documents from paid subscription academic and research databases. This surprised me. I knew that many of these databases were supposed to be made available at reduced rates or at no charge at all to poor and developing nations and to their intellectuals. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. Individuals, even students or faculty members in countries which are not subject to sanctions like Iran, are actually unable to obtain legal access to databases in their dirt poor locales. Even the cheapest, most heavily subsidized repositories for example, the United Nations Hinari Health Database. Even these are available solely to select institutions and only for the exorbitant equivalent of 6 to 24 monthly salaries, about $1,500. The repugnant avarice of most database providers and academic publishers has already spawned phenomena like the open access movement, scholarly publication at no cost to the reader. But the last few years witnessed a virtual onslaught of indignant hackers from developing and impoverished countries. These hackers feel that knowledge should be democratized and made available to all, subject to differential pricing. While it may be reasonable to charge $50 per published academic paper in the United States, United Kingdom or Norway, it is usurious in countries like Mali or Macedonia. Even legitimate sites such as Scribd, are now inundated with pirated copies of textbooks, lists of passwords for research databases, and usernames for university proxies. It is nothing short of a rebellion, civil disobedience, a protest movement the magnitude and effects of which are kept under wraps by its own victims. The overwhelming majority of these hackers are mostly idealists, though they do, they, though they do charge a pittance for the information they harvest in order to defray the hosting and bandwidth costs, they still do it as a labor of love. They still naively believe that the academic community is about furthering learning, not about turning a profit. Many cannot help but feel that while these crackers may be acting illegally, they are not the only bad guys in this outright war of attrition. But what can commercial providers of research or academic databases do to protect themselves? Well, a few simple steps would reduce malicious cracking and unauthorized access and use to almost nil. First of all, users should be authenticated, not only with a username and password, but also with their IP address, where the internet connection is initiated and coming from. This practice is known as geolocation. Secondly, databases should implement rigorous database audit and monitoring DAM, tools to spot, alert and block, block intrusions. And also, they should welcome white hat and grey hat hackers and investigative reporters and ask them to test the system and offer their insights. Shockingly, the current practice is to sue and prosecute such helpful people as malicious crackers if they, if they helpfully share their findings with the affected database providers and vendors free of charge. 